this on. Can you guys hear me okay in the back? We're good? All right. Um, so these are my five boys and little girl. I am, uh, they're everything to me. Uh, Drake is my oldest. He's 11. Hope is my youngest. She's three. The qualities that all of these guys have are just amazing. Drake is so observant. He is just a wise little 11 year old. He's the perfect older brother. Um, Pierce is a dancer. He grew up, he couldn't say, he couldn't say his S's, so he was a, a dancer. And we just love this little guy. He, he danced all the time, but you know, he, he let others affect his excitement to dance. And he's not as big of a dancer as he once was, but just going down each one of these guys, they just, they mean the world to me. And I, I wanted to start here and share a little bit about this because of the incident that occurred yesterday. I feel like understanding our individual worth is of key importance. It's of key importance, not just in school, but in business. And I want to incorporate it into business and how, how my life is affected by individual worth and, and how I have to reset all the time. But thinking of these guys, like I want them to succeed. I know their individual talents. I know that they can accomplish anything they set their mind out, they set their mind to. I know that they're capable. I know that they're enough. I know that these guys are sons and daughters of God, that they're divine. Their natures, they, they are creators. It's, uh, it, it's remarkable to me. And along with that, I know that's who I am. And I know that's who you are. I know that you're creators. I know your worth. I know your capability. I know that you're enough. And understanding what occurred yesterday and, and, and the friend, in the lives of friends and family members, and, and a lot of times ourselves, we don't feel like we're enough. We don't feel worthwhile, worth living. And, and I know that tragedy yesterday is, is so fresh to us. I was here right after it occurred yesterday morning, and, and uh, it, it really... Uh, affected me but and, and it made me think of kind of putting this type of presentation together and explaining how this actually affects all of us and how we need to do better at focusing on individual work in today today's day and age we're losing our individual worth the world wants us to define ourselves by something else so I want to talk about that just a little bit so I, I put this uh, little diagram together really quickly but the path of peace, this is, the, this is a very narrow path for us to be on. This is the path of individual worth. This is knowing that you're a son or daughter of God. This is knowing that you're enough, that you're capable, that you're, you're strong, that you have all the qualities and, and, and characteristics inside of you to allow you to succeed in life. Now, all of us take a step off this path, and I think we do it daily. We do it hourly. It's... We, we get distracted all the time, and in today's day and age, we're distracted nonstop. So, the way that we distract, one of the ways that we distract and, and forget our individual worth is by comparison. We immediately compare ourselves to others. That's one of the worst things that we can do. And, and, and again, I'm going to tie this right into business. Comparing ourselves to our competitors. Comparing ourselves to those who have succeeded financially. That, that we might define their individual worth on their net worth. But net worth is not your individual worth. So we, we do this comparison, and we come over here to what I describe as the pit of pity. And we say, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I can't do that. I can never accomplish what that person's accomplished. And we can live here, and we can define ourselves by things that pull us over here. On the other side is the podium of pride. We might think, I'm the smartest person here. I have created so many things. I've done so much in my life. I'm, I'm a straight A student. I, you know, it, whatever it happens to be, you might put yourself on that, that podium. And in either circumstance, you will go into pain. Those areas cause pain whether you realize it or not. And that pain can fester. And that pain can exist for a while until you realize, or not realize, until you determine you don't have individual worth. And your worth is based off of whatever thing you've, you've labeled yourself as. So giving a couple examples on, on the pit of pity. Um, 
the world defines us by money. So net worth, that, that's how we're defined a lot. So you can say, I am poor. I don't have as much money as that person, or I'll never have as much money. Define yourself there. On the other hand, you might say, I'm wealthy. I come from a very wealthy family. I have so much money. The world wants to define you by your sexual orientation. They want you to say you're gay. That's who you are. And that, that is not who you are. You are a son or daughter of God. If you have same-sex feelings, that's, that's just that. That's not who you are. What other definitions? You can think, well, um, I'm, I'm, studying, I, I'm only studying to be a, a physical therapist. And others might say, well, I'm studying to be a doctor. You know, I'm, I'm studying, I, I'm getting my MBA, my PhD. And you, you define yourself by, I am this in your life. I am a doctor. You define yourself by your profession. You don't define yourself by what really will give you individual worth, which is that you're a son or daughter of God. This is so common. We do this all the time. We judge each other off of these other things all the time. It's so difficult not to. But the one thing you're in control of is your own thoughts, your own feelings, and your actions. And as those thoughts come into your head, you need to recognize those thoughts and bring yourself back and realize that you have individual worth. And I just went through all my little children. Like, think of, think of all of us as children of our Heavenly Father. Like, how proud I was to talk about all my little individual five boys and little girl and my one on the way. Like, God knows you individually. He knows your characteristics. He knows your qualities. And, you know, you might not have the same talents that other people have, but that doesn't make you less than or better than. Just like my little kids. Although I do, I do favor my little girl sometimes. She's my only girl, so my wife will say, you know, you're giving too much attention there. But think of that. Think of your faces on that picture and, and God describing you to others and who you are. To me, this is what it comes down to. This is your individual worth. You are enough. You're capable. You're capable of doing absolutely amazing things. You're loved. You're enough. You're capable. Be these qualities. Be, the, be humble. Be responsible. Be honest. This will keep you in this path of peace. It will keep you centered. It will keep you whole. It will keep you from being less than or keep you from being better than. And again, moving away from the path, it's insecurity. It's insecurity that pulls us to be less than. It's insecurity that pulls us to be prideful and arrogant. Both are covering up because we've lost who we are. We've lost being centered and connected. We get distracted by our phones. We get distracted by movies, video games. We, get, we, we can be distracted by work, by our addictions. This path of peace is work-life balance. It's taking care of your wife. It's taking care of your kids. It's being connected in the moment. If you define yourself on one side where I am an entrepreneur, I am a businessman, if that's who I am, then I'm going to give everything that I have to that and others are going to be neglected. This just occurs all the time in business with, my, with myself, with my co-founders, with all my other friends in the business community. We go back and forth all the time. And it's so critical for us to realize where we need to be. It is a straight and narrow path that we have to stay on. Now that being said, I've, uh, well, the I am, so again, the definition of I am, the one thing that I am, we're, we're reiterated in primary all the time, it's reiterated to us, who am I? I am a child of God. So in business, entrepreneurship, you want to take on big challenges, big ideas, you can let fear pull you away from this path one way or the other. Now. I don't think you guys realize just how big of an idea Homie is. I don't think you guys understand the magnitude of what it actually could be if we accomplish our goals. Now, who am I? Who am I to take on such a big challenge and disrupt the real estate industry? I, I graduated from BYU-Idaho. Is that a less than or a better than? But who am I? This is who I am. I'm a son of God. 
And I know that I'm capable. I know that I'm enough. I know that I have talents that I can magnify. And I know that I can find other people to surround me with, to surround myself with, that also have talents that are capable, that are also focused on their individual worth. This is, this is what we're doing to take on such a massive challenge. I'm going to give you a quote. This comes from a Pete Flint, the co-founder of Truly. I was actually with him last week. Super cool guy. He stated this, tech has done a lot in the last few decades to revolutionize flows of information, Google, communication, Facebook and Apple, goods, Amazon, capital, PayPal and Venmo, and transportation, Lyft and Uber. But real estate is larger than all of these categories combined. And it has yet to be disrupted. The opportunity that exists is absolutely massive. And this is what I want to touch on with Homie again. This is a massive opportunity. I know that I'm a son of God. I know I'm capable. I know I can achieve. That doesn't mean I'm better than, but it doesn't mean that I'm less than. And I want to describe a little bit about Homie. But before I go there, I want to explain how hard it is to take on this type of challenge. Again, if it's bigger than all of those combined, I'll explain the difficulty. So this is a quick diagram of disruption. Things that are easy to disrupt happen in high frequency with a low value. Think of Uber. If you're in one of those big cities, you take a taxi three, four times a day. You take a taxi to lunch, take a taxi home, and it's only a few bucks. So frequency, high frequency, low value. Now on the opposite end, things that are hard to disrupt have a high value and a low frequency. So where does disrupting residential homes lie in this access? It's up at the far, far end. Buying and selling a home happens just a few times in your lifetime. And it's arguably the highest in, in the, the most expensive item you'll ever buy, the biggest purchase of your life. So this is where it's extremely difficult. And for the last three and a half years, we've been tackling this challenge. And I'll explain a little bit about how we got there. Number one, we knew there's a huge cost to transacting in real estate. On a $300,000 home, the average commission for the last Century is about 6%. That's $18,000 that realtors will make on the sale of your home. So hopefully, you've made enough equity in, in, in your home that you can afford to pay that. Now, one of the problems we thought was, well, what if they just bought the home and they have to turn around and sell it? Then they're hosed. They have to come up with $18,000 because they have to now sell it for $318,000 just to cover those costs. And, and that's just the realtor fees. They'd have to sell for more than that to cover all the other expenses. So we thought if we could solve this, we could actually potentially eliminate housing bubbles. Think of it, every year people buy homes and every year when they go to sell it, they have to at least mark it up 6%, at least. We thought this is massive and there's, there's millions of real estate agents nationwide. So thinking of these fees, 3%, 6% gets split into two. The 3% goes to the buyer's agent. If they bring a buyer to the house, they get paid 3% or $9,000. On the sell side, by listing the home, putting it, putting it up for sale, you make 3%. So we analyzed this and we thought, okay, what, what actually can we do to fix this? And we thought, okay, how many, number one, how many transactions occur each year in the real estate industry per realtor? Does anybody know about how many deals a realtor does per year? Any guesses? 50. 50, okay. 50's, 50 sounds like it should be a good number. That should be about, about right. You have another thought? 10? It's less than 10 a year. Full-time realtors do less than 10 transactions a year. They have to charge these fees. They're only doing about one a month in order to live. And the thing is, after they make this 9,000 bucks, they got to split it with their broker for who knows what reason. So there's a broker, and then they have a bunch of agents, and they have to split these fees. So they don't actually make the full $9,000. It's a hard job. If you only did 10 transactions a year, which that's, they do less than 10 a year, but 
that's like less than one a month. It's a hard job. The rest of the time they're prospecting. They're cold calling. They're trying to remind you, hey, are you looking to buy or sell a home? Remember me. That's what they do all day, every day. And they sell one, less than one a month on average. Millions of realtors nationwide. So they have to charge us. We thought, well, what if we could get realtors to do more transactions? <laughs> Can we get that fee lowered? So over the last three and a half years, we've done just that. About how many deals do you think our realtors do a year? Any guesses? We're doing 130 per year, per agent. So just that alone, allowing our agents not to have to prospect, just doing more transactions a year, not have to cold call. We're able to attract really good agents. We're able to lower this cost dramatically. But one other thing we thought, well, what else happens in a transaction? Actually, how much time does it take to actually sell a home? The amount of work. We, we researched this and found that when you go to sell a home, on average, the amount of work that it takes, not the time that it's on the market, but the amount of work that it takes is 16 hours worth of work, is what the National Association of Realtors states in Realtor Magazine. 16 hours worth of work divided by $9,000 is $563 an hour. It's insane. Cardiac surgeons, top cardiac surgeons make about $260 an hour. So we're talking about amazing money. And we thought, if it's only 16 hours, we can. We can do so much more if we just got rid of having to prospect. We thought if we branded a company and created a strong brand that nobody's really done before and just branded the heck out of a company and got buyers and sellers to come to the website, we would just have a bunch of volume to where we could just transact and our agents would be busy all day every day just doing transactions. So from there, we divided the realtor into uh, teams of specialists. So we have a team that just lists the home that just markets the home. We have a team that just does the negotiations and contracts. We have a team that just does tours and tours people on homes. So we've been able to break it down and be able to accomplish to where we, that we can do the same transaction for $1,500. So we've lowered that price incredibly. This is, this is what's been a lot of fun the last year and a half. So again, thinking about if you had to turn around and sell your home, you got to come up with another 1500 bucks versus another $18,000. And our goal isn't just to automate the realtor, but it's to automate the loan process, title and escrow, all the way to close. So this is very similar to what we did at Entrada. So Entrada, we helped people move into apartments online. We helped people pay rent online. Then we helped them buy renter's insurance online. And then we built out accounting software, revenue management software, all these pieces to where we were one-stop shop. It's near identical. Instead of helping renters, we're helping homeowners. They can, they can search for homes online. They can schedule tours online. They can come back from the comfort of their own home after seeing the home, and they can make an offer online, negotiate with their realtor online. All of these different pieces, we've now become a mortgage company. So now we're eliminating loan officer commissions, so we're saving additional thousands on loan commissions. So instead of just getting a loan with your, your local bank or credit union, we've eliminated loan officer commissions because we don't have to wine and dine realtors because we are realtors and we're just feeding the leads right over to our mortgage team. So there's some amazing things that are occurring and all of this over time has allowed us to really differentiate ourselves from the market so we've become the largest broker in Utah in about 18 months period. The largest listing broker in the state. Our homes, not only are we charging so little to sell a home, but we're selling homes faster than the top agents. We're getting our clients 8,000 additional views per home through our marketing efforts. Analyzing and dissecting every little piece of the transaction, we've been able to build something really special. Our median sold price is about $35,000 more than the traditional agent. Our average listing price is $40,000 more. Our sold percentage of asking price is identical. Whether you go with us or go with a traditional realtor that's been around for 20, 30 years, you're going to sell your home for the same price. What that means is that the market actually is what dictates the price of the home. You can try to mark it up, but the market will tell you what to sell it for. If you, if you go low, you're going to get into a bidding war. You're going to get offers right away. If you go too high, it's going to sit on the market a little while. 
But here in Utah, this is what's insane. Here in Utah, our second quarter of last year, any home that was $300,000 or less sold in six days. Why give up $18,000 when your home just sits on the market six days and it sells? Or, or more, or $15,000, or $30,000, excuse me, on a $500,000 home for 13 days. This, these were second quarter stats, and they didn't change much on the third quarter. We're in the fourth quarter, so fourth quarter stats haven't come around. Winter, things typically slow down. But again, think about how long it takes the average consumer to save up 1000 bucks or 5000 or 10000 Are you willing to wait a few days to keep that chunk of change, keeping it on the market? So it's, it's insane. And this is where we felt like we could revolutionize real estate here in Utah and then go nationwide. So we've spread out. We're now in Arizona. We're launching Arizona. Our biggest challenge, the biggest challenge that we have is really the regulatory environment. Here in Utah, there's 14,000 agents. In Phoenix alone, there's 40,000 agents. And that income that they make, there's fear behind it. There's fear behind losing out on that income. So we're turned into the division of real estate nonstop. In Arizona, I just got a call from the attorney general a couple weeks ago, questioning our business practices and what we're doing. The good thing is I have a whole team of attorneys who are actually our realtors. Our realtors, most of them are lawyers also. And the way that it works is very similar to how it works on any transaction. It's just the fact that we've dissected the process, made it a lot more efficient, and passed that money back to the consumer. So it's a win for the consumer. But this is where we're getting the most kickback, the most blowback, is from our competitors. So that's one of the biggest challenges that we have. Um, on the buy side, when you go to buy a home, everybody's now finding their own homes on homey.com, on Zillow, on Trulia, on KSL. No longer do you need to drive around with a realtor that shows you all the homes. Those homes are now online. Consumer behavior shifted, but the cost of transacting hasn't changed at all. And this is what we've set out to do, set out to accomplish. So on average, our sellers are saving about $10,000 on average. Anybody who has a $300,000 home saving about 10 grand in six days. Huge upside. When you go to buy a home, we have about a $5,000 average refund on the commission that's given. So we take that money and give it back to help you pay for closing costs, help you buy down your interest rate. So our offers are stronger when you remove commissions from the transaction. Somebody that comes to buy your home, if you know you don't need to pay the whole 3% commission to that buyer agent, you're going to be willing to adjust your price a little bit, or you're going to want that buyer to come in because you're going to be able to keep more on the sell side. There's some amazing things that happen for consumers. So this $10,000, I think we're up to about $40 million in what we've saved consumers just here in Utah. So that $40 million is now in your bank, and that money is now discretionary income. And discretionary income has about a, two, a 2x multiplier in the economy. So that $40 million is, is having a huge effect here in the economy and wherever we go. So we're doing now the same thing in Arizona. But again, the challenges are just absolutely insane. Um, earlier last year, um, there, were, there were so many complaints about what we were doing by all the local agents, the division of real estate had to continually investigate us and make our lives awful. We had to do so many uh, reports back to them on every transaction, showing every I that's dotted, every T that's crossed. But now, that's actually helped us just become so much more efficient and perfectly clean throughout the process. And of course, as a software company, and as any company, you know, you're not perfect. There's, there's issues, there's bugs, there's things you deal with. But it's been such an amazing opportunity to just attempt to take on such a massive opportunity. And, and this is what I, I feel like you guys have this opportunity as well to do whatever you want. I think about Utah, the venture capital that's coming here. Every big firm in New York, LA, San Francisco is just pumping money back in Utah. We're on the map. It's crazy what's happening. All the companies here that are on Shark Tank, they don't even understand what's going on. They don't know why Utah has such a high number of people that apply and actually make the show. There's so many amazing SaaS companies here that are just taking off, popping up left and right. You see cranes up and down 
I-15, and those are new companies, new businesses just booming. And we're just blossoming. I feel like that prophecy of blossoming as a rose is still occurring. And it's, it's absolutely incredible. I think of what's happening here at BYU. We won the BYU Business Plan Competition in 2003 for Property Solutions. I've been able to be a judge off and on the last several years. I saw Owlet come through. Owlet, I buy one of those little socks to monitor our babies for every one of these little kids. Instead of just putting a camera looking at the crib, you can actually monitor their heart rate and their respiratory rate. And BYU students came up with that, and they're crushing it. I have another friend, Peter Thorpe. He, he invented, a, a, he's a firefighter. He invented a plug that goes in behind the stove. And he found that 45% of house fires were developed or uh, occurred because people leaving the stove on. So as soon as stuff starts to smoke and the alarm goes off, it notifies his plug behind the stove and kills the power, preventing fires. Remarkable. Just some really amazing things. I met the guys at Podium right when they were coming out of BYU, getting going. They've raised crazy amounts of money. And their review tools allowing businesses to, to really find out really good information about what their clients want, what they need, and it's, it's remarkable what they've created. Just what's come out of the school, it's limitless, and your potential is limitless. That's, that's the thing. It doesn't matter who you are, what your talents are. You can get other people alongside of you, get a solid team together of like-minded individuals that have different talents and build something extremely special. Now, that being said, what if homie doesn't change the world? This is a question that you know we ask, that I talk to my wife about. What does that mean? What does that mean about me? It means nothing. Because my self-worth, my individual worth, is not tied as being the CEO or founder of this company. Now I'm going to work my hardest to make it happen because I want to create. I want to achieve. I want to do. I want to grow. But not all businesses succeed in the world's terms. But I, I want you guys to realize that. Like, don't let fear dictate what you're going to do, what you're going to achieve, what you're going to accomplish. Don't let it hold you back. You have an idea? Share it. Talk about it. Build it. And, and come together and, and move forward on it. We're all creators. Naturally, think of your divine worth, your individual worth, who you are as individuals. You're creators. You're enough. You're capable. Don't let fear, don't let all of these things pull you away from that path of peace. Stay connected and, and move forward. This is, this is something that I have to remind myself all the time. There's so many voices that come into our heads. And again, thinking of, of friends and family and others that are struggling and the addictions that we all have. Those addictions pull us away from peace. They pull us away from creating. You might have an idea, then you might get distracted and say, ah, oh, I can't do it. I'm, and then you distract and, and check out your phone or go to YouTube or go somewhere else instead of staying focused and creating. These are distractions that constantly occur, but I just want to make sure you guys realize your divine worth, who you are, especially in light of what occurred yesterday. Thinking of all my little kids and how much I love them, God loves you infinitely more than what I love my little kids, er, than how I love my little kids. He knows our talents. He knows our capabilities. He knows our weaknesses and our challenges. And we can make those weaknesses strength. We know that we can grow. And uh, I, I appreciate this opportunity to, to come here every time to BYU. I'm impressed by you guys. I, I just, I hope um, that you guys reach out I want to make sure you guys can connect with me. My, uh, I'm on LinkedIn. My email is johnny at homie.com. Feel free to reach out at any time with any questions, with any business ideas. I'm, I'm happy to help. Others have done the same to me. Um, they still do the same to me. I still have mentors. I still have people that I go to that, that help assist me, help me overcome challenges and struggles that I'm having with different business problems or people problems or whatever it happens to be. Um, but I, I just want to thank you. and. Open it up for questions. Chris, let's give